Welcome to Sinister Heroes. I'm your host, Daniel Iniquitous. Thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the channel, this is a channel about Dungeons and Dragons where we try to take a darker tone with everything we do here. So if you like edgy kind of content, definitely hit that like and subscribe button. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters. We love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. What you do for us is amazing and we really, really appreciate it. And if you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, the link is in the description as well as the link to our good friends at Critical Failures where we're part of a live stream game. Check us out. With all that out of the way, we're going to jump into this week's video. We're talking about the Blood Domain Cleric. The Blood Domain Cleric comes to us from Taldorai Reborn. This is again a critical role campaign book that was put out. It's kind of as close to like real official content as you can get, as of the prediction of Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, which was critical role, and uh, Wizards of the Coast put together. This kind of follows that same uh, environment and development. Developed in Wildmount by the Claret Orders, the Blood Domain centers around the understanding of the natural life force as it exists within the body and the divine conduit it can become. Those who take up this domain understand that the power of blood is the power of sacrifice, the balance of life and death, and the spirit's anchor within the mortal shell. Gods who grant the power of the Blood Domain, including the Ruiner and the Matron of Ravens, direct their followers to tap into the connection between body and soul, exploit the hidden reserves of will within one's own vitality, and corrupt the bodies of others through the secret rites of Hemocraft. Clerics of good gods use Hemocraft to fill their self-sacrifice with purpose and power, while clerics with fewer morals use the blood of others to achieve their own malevolent ends. So that's a pretty cool description of what a blood domain cleric would be. As soon as you see things like blood magic, especially when it comes to D&D, it does kind of set this huge expectation. So it is very difficult to kind of lead up to that because everyone already, as soon as they hear blood domain, has built up a whole sequence of things to do uh, and powers in the way it works. And it's hard to live up to that focus. So they do, it's never going to meet what everyone's understanding is before they actually see what the subclass's abilities are. So it takes some time to kind of separate the two and kind of keep blood magic as it is in theory and put it in the world of Wizards of the Coast. So at first level, you gain proficiency in martial weapons. This is kind of your your kit with a cleric, especially in the previous editions where the new editions, that's going to probably change a little bit. Um, martial weapons does kind of give you more leeway to pursue a path of strength. You do have access to medium armor, so if you have two in decks, that is usually fine. I would probably opt to get a reach weapon simply because you don't want to be in direct melee and have a little bit of maneuverability might be really beneficial to you. Your other first level ability is bloodletting focus. Your divine magic draws the blood from magically infected wounds, worsening the agony of your foes. When you cast a damage dealing spell of first level or higher whose duration is instantaneous, any creature with blood that takes damage from the spell takes necrotic damage equal to 2 plus the spell's level. Which is pretty good because it's always going to be um, adding on additional damage to you that you're dealing out, not to you specifically, but what you deal out. Uh, it's a passive bonus. It's pretty great. Keep in mind, things like Spiritual Guardians wouldn't fall under this because it's a continuous effect. It has to be like an instant attack kind of action, like Infect Wounds or Ray of Sickness or, or something like that. At second level, you gain your Channel Divinity option Crimson Blood. You can use your Channel Divinity to form a supernatural bond with the creature you can see or with the creature for which you possess a blood sample. This bond lasts for one hour or until your concentration is broken as if concentrating on a spell. While the bond is in effect, you can use an action to learn the target's approximate distance and direction from you as well as its current hit points and any conditions affecting it as long as the target is within 10 miles of you. Alternatively, you can use your action to attempt to connect with the target's senses. You take 2d6 necrotic damage, and a target makes a constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. On a successful save, the bond ends. On a failure, you can choose to either hear through your target senses for a number of minutes equal to your wisdom modifier. During this time, you are blinded or deafened, respectively, 
with regard to your own senses. When a connection ends, the bond is lost. Regardless of the outcome, the target feels a wave of unease pass over it when it makes the save. This is a very interesting ability. This is majority, the majority use for this is going to be in role playing and adventuring scenarios. But you can use this in an event to kind of A, understand that someone's possessed or being charmed by someone into acting a certain way, which in heavy role playing campaigns where there's a lot of political intrigue, that can be really, really important. And two, if you need to know what they're up to, stealing a little bit of their blood will work. And you don't have to get the blood at that moment. You can get it ahead of time. You just have to wait to the right moment to use it. Doesn't say that the blood goes bad at any particular time, so you might be able to do this a few times throughout the time of which you know you carry this blood with you. At sixth level, you gain an additional channel divinity. You can use your channel divinity to briefly control a creature's actions. Whether that creature is living or dead, as an action, you target a large or smaller creature or corpse within 60 feet of you that has blood. A creature you target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or become charmed by you. An unconscious creature automatically fails its saving throw and isn't incapacitated while you control its actions. A corpse targeted by this effect gains a semblance of life that you control. On the affected creature or animated corpse's turn, you can command it, no action required, to move up to half its speed and use one action to do one of the following. Interact with an object, make a single attack, or do nothing. An animated corpse or unconscious creature takes its turn immediately after yours, but can't move or take actions unless you command it to do so. Its statistics are the same as when it was alive or conscious. An affected creature makes a new saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success, for any target you control lasts for one minute or until your concentration is broken as of concentrating on a spell. At 17th level, you can use this feature to target a huge or smaller creature or corpse. So, understand, this is very, very powerful in a variety of different combat scenarios. If you can get someone before, like, before they go down, it's really beneficial to you. But if they go down and you're still taking a beating, raising up one of the enemy forces that did a lot of damage to you would be very beneficial to you. The caveat, if it needing blood does kind of restrict you to maybe not using undead or um, constructs, but you do find plenty of fiends and devils and things like that that do have some sort of blood in them. So it does work on a variety of creatures. My honest opinion is to take out one of the heavy hitters, use Blood Puppet on its corpse, and then take out the rest of them and kind of focus the damage on that. It is a strong ability. Uh, it doesn't say that it comes back with 1 HP. It says it comes back with the same um, stats that it had when it was alive or conscious. So I imagine that includes its hit points. So keep in mind it still rocks out pretty hard for that duration and having an additional target on your side that's absorbing hits or attacks from the enemy always benefits you that's why you have these pet like entities and these summons so that way they can absorb a huge amount of damage so your players and your party members don't so they can really focus down on saving their spells and using them reservedly so that way they can have that big reserve when the time comes to fight the big bad of that area. At 6th level you also gain Sanguine Recall. You sacrifice a portion of your own vitality to recover expended spell slots as an action. The spell slot can have a combined level equal to or less than half of your cleric level rounded up. None of the slots can be of 6th level or higher and you take 1d8 necrotic damage for each spell slot level recovered which can't be reduced in any way. You can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest, so that's a once per long rest usage, and they give you a good example of how it breaks down. Uh, if you're an 8th level cleric, you can recover up to 4 levels of spell slots, a single 4th level slot, 2 2nd level slots, a 3rd level slot, and a 1 1st level slot, or 4 1st level slots. You then take 48 necrotic damage. This seems really beneficial, 
it does give you more options than you would think, especially if you're in a campaign that does long adventuring days with our multiple combats. This does gain a certain level of benefit to it because having that right spell at that right time can make a big difference, especially when you need healing, things like prayer of healing or, or a vitality, those kinds of things could really make a difference. And it's just an action. And you can do that action outside of combat to prevent to, to preventively get ahead of where you might need it and waste an action in combat, which could be really detrimental. At 8th level, you gain Divine Strike. You gain the ability to cause physical wounds you deal out to bleed profusely. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal 1d8 necrotic damage to the target. When you reach 14th level, the damage equals to 2d8. This is not unusual. Usually clerics have this or the other one, I think, lets you add your wisdom modifier to your to your cantrips. Uh, the final ability as a blood domain cleric you gain is Vascular Corruption. You can use your own action to emit a deathly aura of necrotic energy that causes the veins of nearby foes to burst and bleed for one minute. Any hostile creature with blood that moves within 30 feet of you for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there takes 3d6 necrotic damage. If the hostile creature with blood regains hit points while in the aura, it regains only half as many hit points as expected. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. This is not concentration. This is just for one minute. Anything that is hostile to you and has blood takes 3d6 necrotic damage. This, this just happens, which is fantastic. Uh, if you stack this up with something like Spirit Guardians, that's a lot of damage just to take just for being next to you. Keep in mind, you can use martial weapons, so you can use reach weapons, and that you can add Divine Strike and still not be close to an enemy or be in direct contact or um, in a situation where you might need to disengage to get away from an enemy. This gives you a great opportunity to maneuver around the battlefield and ensure you get as many people in that aura as possible. It's just, it's awesome. It's a little bit of damage, but you gotta understand, for a minute and not requiring concentration, that's 10 rounds. That ends up being 30 D6 necrotic damage if they endure the whole thing. That is a lot of damage, and it hits any creature. So the more enemies you are fighting, the more damage per round you are doing just for having this up. This is a very strong ability. It is very unique uh, as far as like just like damage A that there's no save to, B that they just take from being within an aura, and C necrotic damage is one of those damage types where if you're not fighting undead, nothing else is resistant to it. There's a lot of undead in the monster manual, don't get me wrong, but there is a lot more of other entities you'll be facing that this will do a tremendous amount of work on and it's pretty great the blood domain cleric does a good job of getting that feel of what it means to uh be kind of like a blood mage uh the only thing that's kind of missing is a lot of hexes and curses and things like that i wish you really got some of that from the domine, uh, the domain spell list but you do get a whole bunch of strange things that really just seem odd to me. You get haste and slow, which I don't understand how that kind of really fits in. False life, I think makes sense. Whole person, ray of enfeeblement, stone skin even. But blight seems to show up on the domain spells for clerics pretty often. Uh, I just feel like they missed the mark without putting like bestow curse and hex on it. Uh, and other things that might be... Uh, systemic and, and curses and that kind of a feel because I really feel like that would really meet the mark for what a blood someone who uses blood magic does uh, it does try to give you that feel of your 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 blood being a such a vital entity in like mythology and, and religions and faith and especially in fantasy settings where it's kind of like spiritual currency and it seems like you should be spending that uh, and causing your spells to be much stronger, which you do get a little bit out of with Bloodletting Focus, but I feel like I feel like this does a way better job than the Blood Wizard, which we'll cover next. Um, but I I like this. I I really enjoy this. 
I just feel like I wish there was more hexes and things like that on it because it would really bring this more towards like my idea of what a blood cleric would be. With all that said and done, we're going to bring this video to a close. If you've played a Blood Domain Cleric, please tell me what it was like. Tell me if you enjoyed it. I would love to hear about it. If you're interested in playing one, I'd love, love talking characters with all you guys. It's a lot of fun for me. I really enjoy that. Uh, check us out on Wednesday nights with our friends over at Critical Failures for a live stream game. Uh, thank you very much for our Patreon supporters. We love you guys. Thank you so much. What you do for the channel is amazing. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter or checking out Critical Failures, the link is in the description. And thank you for giving a spooky kid a chance.